A warm welcome to Education USA Ghana Facebook Live event. Our Facebook Live program, which is organized every Thursday, is a comprehensive session for all students who have the intention of furthering the education in the US. These sessions are getting more and more exciting every time. Why am I saying that? Well, you will get the answer soon. My name is Margaret Nyako. I am an Education USA advisor as the Education USA Advising Center in Kumase. This evening, Education USA Ghana comes your way again with another great program. This time is about law. I believe as I'm speaking now, you are itching to know more. Our topic for today is your pathway to law school in the US. We are joined by the Director of International and Graduate Programs of Stetson University, and she is Jessica richman Dorkin. Dennis Afote, my colleague advisor from Education USA Accra, US Embassy, is also on this platform. Ladies, you are welcome. Thank to you. my cherished viewers, please type your questions in the <laughs> comments section. It will be answered right after Jessica's presentation. Jessica, please take over for us. Thank you. Um, thank you for, to Education USA for allowing me to speak with the students in uh, Ghana. I'm very excited to have that opportunity today. What I'd like to talk to you all about is how you can study law in the United States. So these are the topics that we'll discuss through the course of our conversation today. First, I'll give you an introduction to US legal education. And then let's talk about how to select the right program, the general application process. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the university I represent, which is the Stetson University College of Law. As Margaret indicated, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please just type them into the Facebook um, chat where you are viewing this and we will answer all of your questions at the conclusion of the presentation. So first, an introduction to US legal education. In the United States, law is a postgraduate degree, meaning that students here first have a university degree in any field, and then they come to law school. The accrediting agency for law schools is the American Bar Association, and they have accredited almost 200 law schools in the United States, which are a mix of both private and public law schools. As I mentioned, you have to first have an undergraduate degree. It can be in absolutely any field. And after you finish law school, in order to actually become a lawyer in the United States, you must have the law degree and you must pass the bar examination in order to obtain your license. There are different types of degrees that law schools may offer in the United States. The traditional law degree is the JD or the Juris Doctor. This is the first degree in law in the United States. As I mentioned, even though it's the first degree, it's a postgraduate degree. Most states require the JD in order to sit for the bar exam and gain your license as a lawyer. And traditionally, the JD program is a three-year program, although it's possible to find some examples both of two-year and four-year opportunities to obtain that degree. There's also a degree called the Master of Laws or the LLM, this is traditionally what most students from outside the United States are interested in pursuing in the US. This is an advanced legal specialization. It's really designed for foreign attorneys and it requires that you already have your first degree in law. This program is typically one year in duration. Law schools are increasingly offering other opportunities such as the MJ or the MLS. These are the same degree programs they just, there isn't a universal naming convention for what we call this degree. But this is a master's degree in law. It does not lead to licensure. It does not make one eligible to become a lawyer. However, it's an excellent option for students that have not studied law if they're a university degree and who wish to understand a little bit more the legal system, perhaps for business or for other opportunities they may have in the future. Finally, some law schools offer the SJD, which is really like a PhD in law. This is a research-based doctorate and traditionally takes somewhere between three and five years to complete. 
It's largely dependent on um, the dedication of the student and how quickly they're able to complete their research dissertation. Law schools in the United States really are different from law schools in a lot of other countries in some important ways. One of these ways is that we really highly value what we call experiential learning. Experiential learning is a method of teaching students where they learn by doing and not just by listening to lectures. Some examples of different types of courses that you will find in US law schools that are focused on experiential learning may include clinics, where students represent actual clients under the supervision of a professor who's also a lawyer, internships and externships, where students may gain some work experience, either for credit or not for credit, as a part of their educational process, or simulation courses, which are courses where students act as if they're acting on behalf of clients, although the clients would not be real in that case. All of these are excellent ways for aspiring lawyers and for law students to put into practice the skills that they've learned in their legal education. In addition, our law students find that the law student life is very challenging. We have rigorous reading assignments and we have a large focus on research and writing skills. So our students spend a lot of their time focusing on these things. There's often no right answer in a US law school. The answer always is highly dependent upon the analysis. And so that can be something that's very different from what other students are used to. We teach our courses with the Socratic seminar approach. And this photograph is a picture of an actual classroom in a US law school. You see the professor speaking to students who are very engaged. Everybody has a seat that's um, designed to allow them to have full visibility of the classroom and to interact and participate with their classmates and the professors. And finally, our law schools are graded on a competitive assessment system, meaning they take an exam, but the grades are competitive and therefore they must do better than their classmates to achieve the top grades in the class. So you may wonder how students go about thinking about what's the right program. Remember, I told you there's more than 200 accredited law schools in the United States, so there are abundant choices. Here are some of the factors that I think students should take into consideration as they're evaluating what might possibly be the right program for them. These factors include the cost of tuition, scholarship opportunities, the cost of living, collectively these all equate to what it actually costs to attend a given university. You also wanna consider career opportunities, the size of the school you're looking at, the type of program that's offered, how much access to faculty you would have as a student, and finally, the size of the international student and faculty presence. Let's talk about each of these in turn. On the scholarship and tuition side of things, this often is complicated for students to really get a final sense of what the cost of attendance is. As a student, you wanna be very savvy about this because cost is obviously an important factor for many students as they make their decisions. You'd wanna look at the cost of tuition for the university, what's the cost to matriculate? And then from that, subtract any potential scholarships that you may be able to be awarded by the university. And then you would add the cost of living. These factors will vary greatly from university to university. Some universities have tuition that could be as low as 30 or $35,000 per year, and they can go as high as 60 or even $70,000 a year. Obviously, that's a big range. Likewise, scholarships also vary. And in looking at scholarships, you also have to look at how you get them. For some universities, you're automatically considered for scholarships when you apply. And for others, you must affirmatively state that you're interested in a scholarship and you may be asked to submit additional application materials to be fully considered for those scholarships. Please ask the universities that you're considering as we're all happy to provide that information, we know that it's important to you. You also wanna look at the cost of living. Larger cities and larger coastal cities in particular, like New York, San Francisco, Boston, Washington DC and LA, often have higher costs of living than smaller cities or cities that are in less populated areas. That will affect the cost of your rent, your books, your food, and the basic costs of things that you need in order to have your year or more in the United States. So when you're evaluating the total cost of your opportunity or the cost of attendance, you have to look at the tuition, 
less the scholarship, and then add in the cost of living. I've given two specific examples here of hypothetical universities so that you can get a sense of how these things tally up. Many students either get intimidated by large tuition costs or excited by large scholarship opportunities without thinking about how they weigh in to the overall cost of attendance for an institution. Please don't be discouraged by smaller scholarships as they may come from universities with a lower overall cost of attendance and don't be blinded or turn away from universities that have a high cost of tuition as there may be other opportunities that can impact the total cost of attendance. Let's talk about how you apply and what the application process looks like. Most law schools have the same basic application components. And so these will be largely similar between universities, but of course you will always wanna connect with a particular institution you're interested in as deadlines and specific requirements can vary. Most universities will require you to fill out an application form. You'll need to submit original transcripts and a diploma certificate from all post-secondary education that you have um, sought out. You'll need to submit a personal statement, a resume or a CV. You'll be asked probably to submit an English exam and the two examinations that are most widely accepted in US law schools are either TOEFL or the IELTS. Some institutions will also require you to, to um, participate in an interview often done um, virtually via Zoom or via telephone. You'll be asked to submit letters of recommendation from faculty or supervisors that know you best. And in the case of the JD degree, you'll be asked to submit an LSAT exam. That LSAT exam is not required for LLM degrees. Again, that's only for the JD degree. Again, the application process and how schools evaluate applications will vary from institution to institution. Most will ask you to submit your application via LSAC, but many schools will also accept direct applications. You will know the answer to this for each particular institution by looking at their website or by reaching out to an admissions professional. They may require a separate scholarship application. This is always something you should ask about. Don't be shy about this question because you wanna make sure that you're availing yourself of any scholarship opportunities that may be available. They may require virtual or face-to-face -face interviews. It's possible that you can negotiate your scholarship. This is something I think students often feel shy or nervous about asking about. Some schools are willing to negotiate their scholarships and some are not, but I've yet to meet a school that's offended by your asking. So feel free to ask and just know they might say, I'm really sorry we don't negotiate scholarships, but they might come back to you and give you a better scholarship than you were initially awarded. It never hurts to ask. You'll then have to go through the visa processing. You'll have to submit financial documents so that you can get your I-20 and then obtain your visa from a US embassy or consulate. And the Education USA advisors can help you not only with this visa process, but also the entire application process and providing guidance and information to you. And then once you've been admitted, you'll be asked to pay a seat deposit to guarantee your spot in the class. And that basically assures the university that you are in fact intending to attend. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Stetson University. Stetson University College of Law, which is the institution that I represent, is based in Gulfport, Florida, which is a very small town just outside of St. Petersburg, Florida. The pictures that you see here are pictures taken of the law school. Our law school is a historic institution. Um, it was built in what was originally constructed as a resort hotel. And so we're very lucky to have very beautiful university grounds. In addition, we are the oldest law school in Florida. Stetson University College of Law was founded in the year 1900. We were also the first university in Florida to admit women to its law school uh, student population. We offer LLM, MJ, and JD degrees in our law school. And we are consistently ranked very highly in both trial advocacy and legal writing. In the most recent rankings, we were ranked number one for trial advocacy and number three in the country for legal writing. These skills, trial or oral advocacy and legal writing, obviously form the foundations of solid skills that all lawyers would want to have, regardless of the particular area of law that they find themselves practicing in. Our LLM is offered in international law, 
and we're actually one of only a few law schools in the United States to share space with a working court. This gives our law students unfettered access to be able to meet with judges and to observe actual court proceedings as they're happening. All of our LLMs are guaranteed an externship placement. It's actually a graduation requirement. And this is something that many students are interested in because one of the reasons that many students want to study in the United States is they're hoping also to gain some work experience in the United States so that they have that ability and opportunity to learn how things work here in addition to how they already know how they work in their home countries. Our JD certificates of concentration include advocacy, elder law, environmental law, international law, and social justice. And even if you're not interested in the JD degree, those concentrations are a very strong indication of the areas of law that Stetson University is known for and that we um, are outstanding in. We have more than 45 student organizations, and these allow our students not only just to get to, one, to get to know one another and to enjoy some of their extracurricular time, but also really to enhance the learning that they receive inside the classroom with some practical and fun opportunities outside of the classroom. Our advocacy teams have won titles both nationally and internationally, and we have a wide variety of clinic and externship programs. We also offer annually six study abroad and six foreign exchange programs, and our LLMs are eligible to do our study abroad programs if that's something of interest. So you could come and study at Stetson and have the opportunity to study abroad in a third country as a part of your time here at Stetson University College of Law. This is a picture of St. Petersburg, Florida. I wanted you to get a sense of what our city looks like. Um, so it's very beautiful. It's tropical with lots of palm trees. That's our um, downtown kind of business center of St. Petersburg. And on the right, you see the flag of our city, which includes a pelican. So we're very proud of being on the coast. These are some pictures of the law school itself. The first one is an aerial shot to show you the law school from up in the sky. So you can get a sense of the size and layout of our law school facilities. And then on the right, you see our swimming pool, which is open for our law school students when they're not studying and they wanna take a break, there are ample opportunities for them to do so. We are located on the west coast of Florida on the Gulf of Mexico. So this map shows you a detail of where we are located. And then on the right, I've given you a picture of a manatee, which is a, a mammal that lives in the ocean. They're sort of unique to this geographic area. I think they're very cute. And they're very peaceful animals. So I wanted to share that with you as well. I hope that gives you a good interview of what it's like to study law in the United States and also a little bit more information about Stetson University's College of Law. I've provided my contact information. You're welcome to reach out to me at any time with any questions that you may have. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Margaret so that we can answer questions. Margaret, I don't hear you. Oh, yeah, sorry. That was a wonderful presentation from Jessica. To my cherished viewers, I believe you are enjoying the session. We have a lot of questions here. Great. Yes, we have a lot of questions for you, Jessica. <laughs> so my, my first question is generally, how much does law school cost? Yeah, it's a great question. I know it's one that's highly important to students. So there's not a really good answer, which is frustrating. Um, so let me give you a general range. I would say um, one of the less expensive law school tuition fees that I have seen is around twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars per year, and I've seen schools charge as much as seventy thousand dollars per year in tuition costs. But that's not the end of the story, because in addition to the tuition, you also have to look at scholarship opportunities. Typically, though not always, schools that have higher tuition rates are often in a position to grant larger scholarships, and that can actually reduce the total cost of attendance that any student might have. And then the cost of living can vary widely. So for example, where I live um, in St. Petersburg, Florida, um, the average cost of rent for a student might be $700 a month um, for rent. But if you went to school in a place like New York City, you might be spending $2,000 a month in rent. 
that can impact the total cost of attendance. What I suggest to students is that if there's a law school you're interested in, just apply. Um, see what happens. Once you see the cost of tuition, but also you have a chance to see what scholarship award you have actually received, that will give you the information you need in order to decide if this is a reasonable place for you to think about attending in the year. So don't assume any school is too expensive or that you won't get a scholarship. My advice is always to apply and see what happens. Okay, so thank you for the answer. There is another question here as an international student. How can I practice law in the US? Sure. So the United States does not require that anybody be a US national in order to practice law in the US. You do not have to be a citizen. You do, however, have to have a license to practice law in the United States. And we don't have a national licensing system. Our licenses are granted state by state. So there's actually 51 different jurisdictions in the United States one for each of the 50 states plus the District of Columbia. And as lawyers gain their license, they're only eligible to practice in the jurisdiction in which they're licensed. So for example, I am a lawyer in Washington DC and in Ohio, but I'm not a lawyer in Florida, which is where I live because I haven't passed the bar exam in Florida. That wasn't an exam that I ever took. So if you're interested in becoming a lawyer anywhere in the United States, you would want to look at where exactly you want to be a lawyer and then figure out what the licensure requirements are for that jurisdiction. It's important to note you do not have to study in the state in which you intend to take the bar exam or get licensed. So I told you I'm a lawyer in Washington DC in Ohio. I actually studied law in North Carolina where I'm not licensed to be a lawyer. So you can study wherever you'd like and then figure out which jurisdictions would allow you to be a lawyer and how the requirements are. If you have specific questions about particular jurisdictions, feel free to reach out to me or to any other law school admissions professional. And we're always happy to give you the information that we have about where students can get licensed. The most popular place for international students to seek their licensure is from New York. And New York does allow students who have graduated with an LLM from an ABA accredited law school and who have taken certain courses during the course of study of their LLM to sit for the bar exam and gain admission to the practice of law. So you just need to know which courses you need while you're registering. Easy, right? Yes, it is. So do I need to take any prerequisites before I apply to law school? Not really. So if you're interested in applying to the LLM, the prerequisite would be that you have your LLB in law from your home country. And if you are in your final year of law studies, that's okay. You can still go ahead and apply during your final year. If you're interested in the JD degree, the three-year degree, you need to have a university degree, but it does not have to be in law. It could be in any field. Um, aside from your university degrees, you would need an English test, either the TOEFL or the IELTS, and then simply to complete the application. Wow. Um, I have another one here. What, I, what should I be looking for in a law school? Yeah, this is another hard one, a great question, but a hard one to answer because I think everybody looks for something different. Um, so the factors, let me go back to the slide back there um, to show you the things I think you should be looking at. These are the factors that I would consider. So what's the cost, that cost of attendance made up of that calculation between the cost of tuition, scholarship opportunities, and the cost of living? I would look really hard at career opportunities. What are your future career goals and which law school is going to be best suited to help you achieve them? What's the size of the school? Again, there's no right or wrong answer here, but schools can vary widely in their size. You could go to a very large school or a very small one. So let me give you an example. Stetson University College of Law, I would say is a fairly small law school. We have probably about, uh, I don't know, maybe 700 students on our campus. And our campus consists only of the law school. We're part of a larger university called Stetson University, but Stetson University is located in a different city in a different part of the state of Florida. So here in St. Petersburg, we're just a law school and we're fairly small. As a contrast, I went to university at a school called the Ohio State University. 
The Ohio State University has about 50,000 students on its campus. You can imagine the difference in a campus with 700 students versus a campus with 50,000 students. I think they're both exceptional opportunities, but they obviously offer a very different experience and a different um, chance for you to view what a U.S. university is like. So that might be something you want to consider. You should also look at the type of program. Do they have the type of program or the specialty that you're interested in? Access to faculty. U.S. faculty are very used to engaging with students. They don't simply lecture and then disappear into their offices. They want to engage with students. They want to get to know you. They want to learn from you as much as you're learning from them. So are you excited about that or does that seem intimidating? And how much access do you want to those faculty members? And then finally, I would look at international student and faculty presence. Is the law school itself international? Does it already have a lot of international students and international faculty members on campus? Or is it really a very small international population? Again, both of those provide very different opportunities for students and both could be quite positive, but you have to decide which one would make you feel more comfortable. Wow. At Cherish viewers, you are watching Education USA Ghana Facebook Live event. Our topic for today is your pathway to law school in the US. Please keep your questions coming. We are at the question and answer session. Jessica, I still have a lot of questions for you. What? Um, yes, yeah, so my next question, it's reads. Is it possible to get full scholarship for law school? Yeah, so it is possible, but it is rather difficult. So I do want students to have that understanding, but don't assume you can't do that. There are some law schools that are able to offer a full tuition scholarship. Um, sometimes you can get the equivalent of full tuition scholarship by also participating in the Fulbright or in other scholarship opportunities where the funding might not entirely come from the university. I've also had students ask me in the past, I really need full funding. I need tuition and I need housing or I need living expenses. Is that something that's possible? Again, the answer is yes, um, but it's not common. One of the misunderstandings I think that takes place with international students from a lot of different countries is students think they can do um, an assistantship or some sort of teaching assistant position with the university and that that would cover the cost of tuition. While that's common in some graduate programs in the United States, that's generally not the model that law schools use. And so that's generally not available at a law school. If you need full funding, you would wanna look for schools that offer large merit-based scholarships that could offer you that opportunity to get full funding. Um, you can reach out to schools and ask them if that's something that's realistic um, in their admissions process. And you can also work with your Education USA advisors who may be able to help point you in the right direction of schools that have larger finance available for students. Thank you. So how can I increase my chances of getting into law school? Yeah, um, I mean, I think there's a few things. And again, every law school does their admissions slightly differently. Um, this is the, I'm at the third law school where I've been directly responsible and involved in admissions decisions. So I can at least tell you what I've looked for um, and what I think many of my colleagues look for. So first, you need to have a strong academic background. We want to see students that have already achieved, that have done well in their legal education, um, that have perhaps some experience um, working, that have a real purpose, that are driven, that know what they want to do. Um, and that can explain that to us. So you might be stronger in some of those areas and weaker in others. They can balance each other out. That's generally what we look for. When I read application, I would say there's kind of two things that are really important to me. Um, as a starting point, you need to have, I guess, three things. You need to have good grades and good scores on your TOEFL or IELTS. That's sort of where I begin. If the grades or the language skills are not sufficient, it's unlikely that I'm going to admit a student to my program. Those are the things I look for at the very beginning. But there are a lot of students in the world that have good grades and good language skills in English. So we look for more than that. I like to look at the personal statement or the statement of motivation of a student. I want to know, not that you can espouse legal philosophy at me or talk about really esoteric topics, but I want to know what you're excited about what you're passionate about and why. I still remember a personal statement a student wrote for me probably 12 years ago 
the student wrote a personal statement about how his hobby was rock climbing and he loved to do rock climbing. So whenever he had free moment or he had holidays and he took vacation, he would go rock climbing with his family or with his friends. And he started to notice that the equipment he needed to purchase in order to be safe during these rock climbing adventures cost more inside his country than it cost when he would buy the same goods in other countries. And he didn't understand why that would be. And as he did research, he learned about tariffs and imports and export and trade law. And that made him really passionate about trade law, which is what he wanted to study in law school. That essay stands out in my mind because it told me what he wanted to study and why. And it gave me a really good glimpse into his personality and it told me a little bit about them. So I like to know what it could be. You could be interested in anything and I don't need to share your interest, but I wanna know what you're interested in, that you have passion for something. I wanna know why that's the case. And in an ideal world, I want it to be something I find really interesting so that you're somebody I'd wanna sit down and share a cup of coffee with and learn a little bit more about you. I think that's really important. The other thing I look for are, are um, excuse me, are letters of recommendation. And these, I think many international students find really mysterious because you're not quite sure what we're looking for as admissions officers. So what I look for in, per, in keep saying personal statements, I'm sorry, in letters of recommendation is I don't get overly excited about the title of the person who's writing the letter for you. So it doesn't have to be the person who has the most senior position in the organization, whether they're a professor or a dean or a government official, I'm not really interested in that. What I want to know is that they genuinely know you and that that's what's displayed in the letter. So I'd love for letters of recommendation to tell me about your great leadership skills or your ability to excel in the classroom or the kindness you take in helping your classmates understand things when perhaps you have a better understanding than they do or some really exceptional leadership skills that you displayed in an extracurricular activity. I want them to tell me who you are as a person and why those skills are super beneficial and why they might benefit my institution if you were part of the student body here. So again, I'm really focused on the content of those letters, not so much on the title of the person who's writing them. I think that's good for you to be aware of as you think about who you wanna ask to write those letters for you. Wow. Um, I have another question, but Bernice, please prepare because right after this question, I'll come to you for an answer. So Jessica, um, a student would like to know how long it takes to complete the different law school programs in your school. Sure. So the LLM program we say is a one year program. It's really nine months. So students that begin in August typically will graduate in May. Some schools allow you to begin in January and then you would graduate in December. That's a one year program. The JD program is typically three years. The MJ program is also typically one year. And then the SJD program ranges between three and five years, depending upon the length of time it takes for a student to write a dissertation. Encourage viewers, you are watching Education USA Ghana Facebook Live event. We are talking about law here. So, Benis, I come straight to you. Um, my question is, someone wants to know what Education USA does for Ghanaian students. Okay, thank you. So, Education USA is a big network supported by the U.S. Department of State to provide information on U.S. higher education. Anything after high school is considered as higher education. Going for a first degree, master's, doctorate, all those will be higher education. So if you are interested in applying to schools in the U.S. for a first, second, or doctorate degree, we are here to help. We let you understand the process of applying to schools in the U.S. Some people feel that if they just take a test, a standardized test like a GRE or SAT or any of those, and they make a good score, they're ready to go. But looking at Jessica's example for law school, you can understand that there is more to it than just taking a test. 
So we take our time and explain the process to you and also walk through each step. We have five steps in the process. Step one is researching your options. Like Jessica is explaining, with law school, you don't just go to school. You need to choose a school that aligns perfectly with your interests and your goals. US has more than 4,000 schools. So when you're choosing, you need to choose carefully so that you won't get an admission and possibly get to the school and regret that you've come there. We help you to think of all the things you need to consider. Jessica mentioned cost of education. US education is expensive, but there are ways to um, relieve yourselves of the burden. She also mentioned about scholarships. And it's not every school that is able to give scholarships. Some can be very generous to the point of taking care of everything. Some just by matter of policy are not able to give anything at all by way of scholarship. So we help you to understand all these things. And then step two is working on your funding. Step three is completing your application. Step four is working on your visa. Um, so we help you go through all these steps. Our goal is to enable you apply and be a successful student in the US. Step five is pre-departure. We help you to prepare to go. So in a nutshell, this is what Education USA does for you. From the time you make up your mind to study in a US school till the time you're ready to go, we're there to help you through all the steps. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm still on you. I have another question for you, Bernice. So the next question is, the president says he will be opening the border soon. If I have a visa already, can I go to school now? That's a very, <laughs> I don't want to say tricky, but kind of hard question. Um, if you have your visa already and your school will allow you, you need to check very well. This is more like an immigration question than an EDUSA question. So you need to check with your school because I know that normally when schools start classes, you have a certain time by which they can allow you to come and join. At this time, I know that most schools are doing virtual classes. A few have the hybrid, which is a mix of virtual and then in-person. So you need to check and be sure that um, you can actually travel. Check with your school. If they say, yeah, you're good to go, then you may want to. You also have to be sure that your visa status is still good to travel with. Thank you for the answer. So Jessica, this is another question for you. Does a practicing lawyer still have to take the bar exam after LLM to be licensed? I, I'm sorry, Margaret, I didn't hear the first part. A practicing lawyer? Does a practicing lawyer still have to take the bar exam after LLM to be licensed? So if you're a practicing lawyer in Ghana, yes, because you're not a practicing lawyer here in the United States. So the bar exam really is a test of your knowledge of our legal system here in the US. If you were a practicing lawyer in the United States already, perhaps you had done a JD first, and then you did an LLM, you would not have to take a bar again. Um, but if you're a practicing lawyer in Ghana or in your home country, and then you come to the U.S. and get an LLM, you would still need to take a bar exam here in order to be allowed to practice law in our country. Okay. Is it compulsory to take the LSAT before I'm admitted to a JD program? So this answer is actually evolving. You guys have fantastic questions in this group. Um, so traditionally, the answer is yes. The LSAT exam is, is one of the key parts of the application to the JD program. And so the LSAT generally is required. 
there are some law schools that now are willing to accept the GRE instead of the LSAT. And so you need to check with the particular schools you're interested in to see if they will look at a GRE score instead of an LSAT. But in all cases, you almost always have to take a standardized exam, either the LSAT or the GRE, prior to any admissions decision being rendered. Most law schools that I know will not even look at your application to even begin to think about whether or not they're going to give you admission until those test scores are a part of your admissions file. So they are very important. Right. So the next question, will I still get a law school if my LSAT score is low? It depends. Um, so different law schools have different median LSAT scores that they look for. And again, I'm only talking about JD programs right now because for the LLM, the LSAT isn't required. So there are different schools that look for different scores on the LSAT. So as you might imagine, um, schools like Harvard or Yale are going to want to see a very high LSAT score. They're some of the most competitive law schools in the country to get into. And then there are other law schools that are willing to be a bit more forgiving about LSAT scores. And they may look for other things in your application that are indicators to them that you would be a great student for their program. Maybe you have work experience. Maybe you offer diversity to their law school. Maybe there's some other value that you bring beyond a test score. So it really depends on the particular schools you're looking at. What I would recommend is if you've not yet taken the LSAT, you should prepare for it. It's a test you can actually study for and prepare for. You shouldn't just show up and take it and hope it goes okay. That's not a good strategy. Um, and then once you've taken the LSAT and you've received your score, I would work very closely with the Education USA advisors um, because they can help guide you as to which schools are going to be better fits for you given that score that you've attained. So what can I do with a law degree? Um, you can kind of do anything with a law degree. So it's one of the more versatile degrees that's available. Obviously, of course, you can be a lawyer. Um, and that's sort of what most people with law degrees do. But in addition to being a lawyer, people have found that law degrees are excellent backgrounds for becoming business people, for being involved in government, for making public policy, for being um, university administrators, right? I have a law degree and I'm working as a university administrator. You could um, be a consultant and give advice to other people. The thing is with a law degree, particularly one obtained in the US, the key skills that we focus on in the US law schools are obviously learning the law, but even more important than that, having strong analytical and critical thinking skills, good oral communication skills and oral advocacy skills, and excellent writing abilities. As you might imagine, good written and oral communication skills, as well as good critical thinking and analytical skills are skills that can be used in any range of fields and professions that you might imagine. So studying law in the United States is a great background for all kinds of things. Thank you for the answer. But with COVID-19 in mind, will schools still insist on the LSATs exam? I believe that they do. Um, the LSAT itself has been evolving because we recognize that COVID-19 is posing challenges in ways that none of us could have imagined a year ago. So the LSAT is now being administered uh, online and virtually as opposed to being re uh, requiring students to show up in person so that we can um, ensure that the health and safety of students taking the exam and of people administering the exam is protected. So the LSAT is still required just as it was before but how the LSAT is administered has changed. So I would encourage you to look into that and see what's being offered in Ghana. Um, I suspect it's changing globally. Thank you. So Benny, this is for you. Do you know when the US Embassy will open to the public? Thank you. Um, I do not know, but the Embassy has there's a posting, okay, on the embassy's Facebook page and also on the website. 
So to get more details, it might be good for um, students and individuals who are interested to visit the, the, the pages, either Facebook or the website and read that post. I think they have pinned the post to the page. So you really get to see the moment you're on the page so that they can update themselves on, 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 on timelines. Okay, thank you very much. But Benis, I still have this question for you. Okay. I heard about the competitive college club that Education USA provides. Mm -hmm. Can you please educate us on it? How can we apply? Okay, how thank can you. We qualify? Thank you. The Competitive College Club um, is a club of made up of students, usually um, recently um, or recent high school graduates. So we work with them throughout the application process. We select them from schools. We send applications out to um, our contacts at different schools. And this is usually given to students who are very competitive academically and are also interested in applying to schools in the US. We, at this time, we're looking at doing everything virtual. So I'm still um, talking with some counselors to see now that high school students are, I mean, finalists are writing their exams. We're in discussion with them so we can send the forms to them to give to their students. In the past, when um, there was no COVID, people could also walk into the embassy on advising days and pick forms, apply, and then bring it for us to review. But now we're using a school contacts mainly to do that. So if this person is still in school, he or she can talk to the, um, their, any of their teachers to contact me, or he or she can contact me directly. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to Jessica for an answer. Um, how does your law school review applications? When? So we how review. Does I think you're asking when, Margaret, is that correct? Yes. OK. We review our applications on a rolling basis. And what that means is as we receive applications and as those files become complete, meaning we've received all of the documents that we need to have, we go ahead and begin reviewing applications. So we'll begin reviewing applications later this fall. Um, I'm expecting our application to be available as of either mid-September or October 1st at the latest. And then we will begin reviewing applications and making decisions as quickly as we have applications. And we will continue to admit students um, all the way through May. My advice for international students is applying earlier is better, um, both because it gives you more time to work on getting your visa and arriving in time to Florida, but also there are more scholarships available at the beginning of the application cycle as we spend that scholarship money by offering it to students, there becomes less and less scholarship available for people that are applying later in the process. So if scholarships are important to you, and they are to most people, I would encourage you to apply early. Most students usually apply, I would say December and January are the busiest times for us in terms of the number of applications we receive. Okay, so I'm going back to what Benny said. I just want to add something little to the Competitive College Club. Um, I want our cherished viewers to also know that Education USA Kumasi also has the Competitive College Club. So just send us an email or give us a call and we'll be there to give you further directions as what to do. So I come back to you, Jessica. What kinds of recommendations are most helpful? The ones that come from people that know you the best, but not your mom. So if you could get a letter from somebody you've worked for, if whether it was a volunteer position or a paid position, or perhaps from a professor that you've had the opportunity to get to know really well, um, anybody that can speak to us about 
what makes you special, what makes you stand out from some of your peers and colleagues and why you would be a great student for us to have in our program. Those are the people that we wanna hear from. So how do you help students and graduates find jobs outside the region around your school? Yeah, it's a good question. So we have a global network of alums um, that are all over not only the United States, but all over the world. And we're really lucky that we're still in touch with many of our folks. So one of the benefits of being at a small school like Stetson is we know all of the people that have been in our program. So we routine, routinely make introductions um, of our current students to prior students. We reach out to them. We really operate like a family. And so if I call somebody who was my student, you know, six years ago or 10 years ago and say, hey, I have a new student and, you know, you're both from Ghana or you both have an interest in soccer. Or there's something that you both have in common. Would you be willing to talk? They always say yes. And so we're able to help students in that way. And in addition to the alumni that have come through our schools and our alumni network, um, we all, the people that work in my office, as well as all of the faculty here at Stetson, we have our own professional network of contacts all over the world of people that we can reach out to um, and introduce students to, or just to sit down with students and think about ideas and new, new thoughts or places they should look at that maybe they didn't know about or they hadn't thought of on their own. So we work really hard with each of our students, really on an individual basis, because what works for one person might not work for another person. And so we try to tailor the advice that we give but we work with each of our students to help them find the opportunities that they ultimately want. Thank you, Jessica. So do you offer law school study abroad programs? We do. We have um, usually six programs. So typically we offer a study abroad program in the Cayman Islands, um, December and January. Um, this year, unfortunately, we've had to cancel that program because of COVID-19. Um, but I fully expect that program to be back next December. So um, when many of you might be thinking about doing an LLM, we should have that program back. We offer four study abroad programs every summer. We offer a study abroad program in The Hague in the Netherlands, in Oxford, in Granada, Spain, and in Cape Town, South Africa. And we also typically have a study abroad program happening over our spring break, which would be a week long study abroad. And the destinations have varied from year to year, depending upon proposals that our faculty or our students have submitted that they're interested in. So those are kind of our standard study abroad offerings and our LLMs are eligible to participate in those. Okay, so Jessica, can you please describe the on and off campus housing opportunities for students? Yeah, absolutely. So um, let me try to go back to some of my pictures and I'll show you this. Uh, so this is a picture of our campus, as I indicated. Um, this picture with the pool, the buildings you're seeing above the pool, that's actually some of the dormitories where some of our students live. And the picture that's behind me, if you all see me talking, that's a picture of our campus. Those buildings also are the dormitories. So our on-campus housing are single rooms. So students would have a private bedroom and private bathroom um, that would be fully furnished that are on our campus within in the aerial shot within the campus itself that are quite convenient for students. You don't have to worry about buying furniture or needing a car or anything else. So those opportunities are available for law students and dormitories are something that many law schools cannot offer to their students. So that's something we're very excited that we have. We also off campus own a lot of property in the immediate area of the law school. So there are, there's an apartment uh, complex about three blocks from the law school, so walking distance that has apartments students can live in. They tend to be, um, most of them are two bedroom, two bathroom with a shared kitchen um, and a shared living space that students can live in um, and come to our law school. And then we also own a lot of the homes that are near the law school. So students also sometimes have friends they wanna live with and they can live in a home that's near our campus that's owned by the university. In addition to those university owned op um, opportunities of dormitories or apartments or homes that you can rent, there are also a number of privately owned either homes or apartments in the immediate vicinity that our students can live in. Um, and it's really up to you depending upon your preferences and your budget. There's a lot of different opportunities. One of the nice things about Gulfport um, where we're located is it's a very, very safe community. 
And so that's not something that our students really have to worry about at all. They all feel quite at home and quite safe in our area. Okay, so how important is the personal statement in your admissions process? It's very important. I will tell you when I look at applications, the first thing I look at is the grades and the language tests just to see if the student meets the minimum requirements that I'm interested in. The very next thing that I read is the personal statement. Um, so it not only gives us a window and an insight into who you are and what you're passionate about, it also serves as a writing sample. So we can see how well you're able to write in English, how structured are you, how logical are you, how clear are you as a writer. Um, for both of those reasons, it's a very, very important document. I would encourage you to spend a lot of time on it and to make revisions, to write it, put it aside, come back to it in a day or two and make some edits and really focus on it. You don't want to have errors in your personal statement. It needs to be well done. Thank you. Thank you. So how accessible are the professors? Um, incredibly accessible. So one of the things that I love about Stetson is that it does truly have a small family feel. So the professors are incredibly accessible. As you look at this aerial map of the campus again, you can see the red, the red roofs, that's the law school. That's our law school community. And all the area around it are really private homes. Many of our professors live in walking distance of our law school, um, including myself. So our students walk around, they run into professors, we see each other at the grocery store, we see each other at restaurants, um, we make ourselves available to the students. So um, I have yet to hear of a student who was unable to connect with or to have a conversation with the professor. The professors here love interacting with students and they are very accessible. Okay, so do graduates typically find full-time jobs after graduation? That's a tricky question. So do graduates find jobs? I would say yes. Do they find jobs in the United States? That's a little bit harder. And do they find jobs in the United States in the field that they want to do? Again, a little bit harder. So it's always been challenging, I think, for international lawyers to find long-term jobs in the United States. It's quite possible to find a job for a year during your OPT. Um, but if you're intending to stay here permanently, it's a bit more difficult as the visa hurdles become a little bit more difficult. Um, it is certainly possible. I think we don't know yet what that's going to look like as the economy begins to recover from the um, global pandemic and COVID-19. The economy obviously is a bit weaker now um, because of the pandemic and the economic impact of that. At any time that there's economic impact and the economy is weaker, it's harder for everybody to find jobs, not just international students, but even for um, domestic students. It's a little bit more challenging. So it's hard to predict what it's gonna look like over the next year or two, um, but it's certainly possible. I would say students that are successful tend to um, have excellent academic credentials. They often already have some work experience, so they have some real experience they can bring to the table and they're willing to do new things. So they're willing to network. They're willing to kind of get out of their comfort zone and try some new tactics and finding jobs and be flexible about what they're looking for. So it's not easy, uh, but it is possible. Wow, thank you. This will be my last question for the day. So which companies most frequently recruits from your law school? So the ones that um, recruit the most would be large law firms that come to our campus or that specifically seek out our students. Those law firms are located all over the United States. They're large major law firms um, both from the, the Bay Area, the Tampa Bay Area, from all of Florida, from the Southeast region from the United States, but even farther afield from other parts of the United States. Stetson's known as a very good law school. So top law firms want good students from Stetson Law. Um, so really any law firm would be kind of the most common because we're producing lawyers and most lawyers work for law firms. But our grads also find jobs in locations other than law firms. So they also tend to go to companies or they go into business, they might go into government. Um, our graduates have found success in any number of fields. And so it really, again, it's what you're after and what you're interested in. That will be the determining factor. Thank you very much, Jessica. So, Benice, do you have any tips for us or final words for us? Thank you, Margaret. Um, I want to say thank you very much to Jessica. 
for educating our audience, but also the advices. So thank you. <laughs> I want to say to our audience to continue to work with Education USA um, so that they can understand the process well and be in charge. So they will not just be doing to get a school, but they will be um, going through the process in order to choose schools that are best suited to their needs. So they will eventually go to school and come out and be who they want to be. I wish everybody well, and I thank you all for continuously patronizing these weekly programs. We are very grateful and we look forward to doing more of such. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica and Bernice, for that wonderful presentation. And thank you, our cherished viewers, for joining us today on our Education USA Ghana Facebook Live event. We believe you found this session insightful. Please be following us on our Education um, USA Facebook pages. And please keep joining us on every every Thursday, same time, which is 5 p.m. Please don't miss it. We will be sharing our contact details. Please contact us directly, and we will be there to answer all your questions for you, guide you through the whole process. Please have a good evening. <laughs>